Okay, so right, I'd like to talk a bit about um, uh, the environmental change, uh, climate change, and um, and adaptation, um, and the way that policy can rapidly change uh, this adaptation. Uh, I'm getting somebody's Michael. I'm, I'm getting your screen instead of mine. Hello. Yes, uh, I'm not sure why that would be. Apparently, we are still seeing John's. Well, there's a, yes. Yeah, there's a Zoom screen right on the top of my my text. Huh. Okay, we're good. Okay, so um, so broadly, what I'm going to talk about is um, uh, the way resources are used, and we're going to look at a simple case here. These are kind of agricultural resources, because when we talk about uh, adaptation to climate change, uh, for many uh, groups in the world, what we're talking about is a reworking of how resources are used. Um, and so this is water, this is land, uh, this is crop production, et cetera, uh, people moving from one place to another. As these adaptations are uh, attempted, it is a, it is a change in the way rights are, are actually used. And what actually facilitates that or, or thwarts that, prevents that, are these systems of rights, rights to use resources. So these rights are what are, are changing uh, through adaptation. So, so we wanna explore this change in rights to resources as, as people across the globe explore new ways of adapting to climate change. And we wanna look at how sensitive these rights arrangements are to things like policy, right? Um, and as we'll show in, a, in, in this case, they, are, they can be uh, quite, quite um, sensitive. So uh, the idea that uh, as adap ad adaptation, uh, it moves, right? People move from one area to another in adaptation. They start to do things differently because they need to uh, adapt. A policy environment is going to be able to either facilitate this, allow this to happen, or it's going to really, uh, really thwart it, really create problems. So policy can do either, either one. Uh, the primary issue here is that we'd like to see, of course, policies facilitate uh, rights change to resources in order to um, to make for successful adaptations. But if they do not, if policy instead seeks to stop or thwart or make problematic uh, adaptations, then people don't stop adapting. They continue adapting. Some of these adaptations that they continue to do in the face of negative policy approaches can be negative. They can be destabilizing. So we have to view adaptation in, in a couple of ways. We usually think of adaptation to climate change as being a, a positive, successful change in one's life or, or lifestyle that allows you to, uh, to adapt. Uh, but they can also go in a different direction. They can be, they can be uh, a problematic, they can be violent. So violence is an adaptation to, to climate change. Uh, taking land and rights from others is, a, is a, also a, a adaptation to, to climate change. So in order to guide this going one way versus another, there, there's a strong role of, uh, of policy. And so an example that we, we can look at here are, is one of migration. So migration, as we know, is a primary response to climate change. Migration can either lead to successful adaptation or can lead to another form of adaptation, which is uh, conflict, and, and in our case, armed conflict. So let's look at Darfur, because Darfur is, is an example of both, where migration uh, resulted in positive adaptation to climate change, and then a change in policy destroyed that and actually resulted in um, a different forms of adaptation that, that uh, in the latter case included, uh, included violence. So, so to set the broad scene here, what we have here is uh, Darfur, as we know, in, in Western Sudan, it sits uh, just below the Sahara Desert, uh, and it, it, it itself is in the, in the Sahel. What was a normal way of, of operating in Darfur was that nomadic pastoralists from further north in the Sahara Right, sought to adapt to a changing environment. In other words, their environment grew more drought prone. Uh, 
more difficult for grazing uh, schedules to be followed and for uh, for livelihoods to be pursued. And so they, they migrated south. The prevailing land rights system in the south was able to successfully accommodate these changes of the nomadic pastoralists. So the nomadic pastoralists show up in the south, the institutions, the rights systems regarding resources in the south successfully adapted to this change. So, so in this case, it is a successful case of adaptation to, to climate change. However, state policy then disrupted this adaptation uh, success and, and process and went about constraining options and reduced the ad adaptive capacity of the tenure system of the largely farming uh, communities in the South. This led to the pursuit of different adaptation options in order to obtain the desired rights to land resources. Uh, one of the primary adaptation options, uh, of course, then included armed conflict. Uh, so let's get into the, the history of this a little bit. I would see from this map on the upper right, um, these long sort of um, uh, pathways, if you will, first green up in the Sahara and then and then turning to yellow when they entered Darfur. These are established nomadic pastoralist routes that over the course of centuries uh, have been agreed upon between the, the nomads and the farmers in, in the south. And so this is the normal sort of annual migration routes that the nomads and their herds would take as they moved from the Sahara down into, uh, into Darfur, where they would spend uh, the dry season and then move back up. The timing of the, of the arrival of the pastels is of course important because this is a farming area. Uh, it's difficult to have enormous numbers of camels show up in a farming area prior to harvest. So uh, the timing is intricate here. It's very important. The location's intricate. And all these things were agreed upon between the farmers and the pastels so that the pastels showed up just after harvest. Went into the farmer's fields, and did the farmers a, a favor by having the grazing go on in the, the crop remnant or stover it's called. This is the, the part of the crop plant that is not harvested, it's left in the field. The camels would um, uh, uh, eat this and then also provide manure for fertilization of, of, the, uh, of the fields. So, so the, the institutions and the, the roles of the different people that went on to have this successfully operate over such a large area for such a long time, is actually fairly impressive it, from an institutional point of view in terms of, of, of uh, adjusting and, and controlling access uh, to rights. So fast forward to uh, uh, the current uh, day and, and the nomads, instead of uh, coming down periodically, seasonally, now come down and, and start to stay uh, because the, the areas further north are, are so much drier. So this is where our adaptation becomes uh, interesting. So now, now they become permanently present in areas that they previously only transited through. So this alters the timing and location of livestock movements, uh, and they themselves then also started to farm to offset the, uh, the the decrease in the, in their herds. But again, the the the, the resource rights um, arrangements between the nomadic pastoralists and the farmers were successfully able to accommodate this change. So this was a successful adaptation. Tensions were managed, new ways of interaction between groups were, were handled, and local customary institutions were able to facilitate uh, this form of, of adaptation. Some of the institutions to look at here, uh, Hakura tenure is, uh, is a farmer tenure, right? So this is broadly a form of, of land rights that is fairly adaptable. Uh, inside that, it's got some important roles here. We have shake of the people, manage village level organization, shake of the land, manage the allocations and administration. And OMDA was a political institution. And then on top of all that, we have the paramount chief, which is, which is a, a leadership uh, institution. Broadly, this is all called the native administration, right? So this is a very customary, but also including some form of statutory or state level uh, laws and approaches to, to managing uh, rights to land resources. So this broadly provides a system of, of local governments to which the nomadic pastoralists and the farmers buy into and operate and, and use to successfully adapt to a, a, changing, a changing climate. Uh, so management of the resource rights by the native administration 
um, resulted in a change in land rights and resource allocate, uh, uh, arrangements to meet the new challenges, right? So we have changes in the regulation of grazing and farming activities in order to avert conflicts and tensions. So that successfully went on. Boundary enforcement had to change. So new areas became demarcated to allow grazing activities to occur there and not overly threaten farming areas. Uh, resource rights disputes, uh, institutions were derived to, to handle these uh, effectively, managing, of course, resource, uh, water resource opening and, and closing. Uh, and then we uh, had an interesting innovation go on where uh, nomadic groups were attached to a locally trusted advocate to, to advocate for their, uh, their, their needs in terms of, of adaptation. This advocate was a position now within the native administration. And so, so what we saw was a very well-working, fluid, adaptable, changeable, but a well-working way to, to adapt to, uh, to, to uh, a, a changing climate. And then the Sudanese government uh, uh, got involved and dissolved, got rid of the native administration and recreated it later, but with members of its own choosing, selected by government instead of local constituencies. The native administration then became highly distrusted and political and ineffective. It crippled the functionality of the entire customary land rights system. So it did away with this primary way of adaptation to successfully uh, occur. The government bypassed for political reason, land shakes. Right? So now we saw a disruption in the management of livestock crop interaction in, in many ways. And this meant that the livestock entered cultivated areas prior to harvest and destroyed crops, creating tensions that were unmanageable now between the owners of the crops, the farmers, and the livestock herders uh, themselves. And so the government increased the use of its own statutory laws for land, and here's the list of that, most of which were not made for Darfur. They were made for the vast irrigated areas to the east of Sudan, but they were applied to the west. And so we saw through this use of, of statutory law application and the dismissal of the native administration and its laws, a very large set of problems uh, emerged. Land disputes became unresolvable. Uh, particularly between the tribes, the, the, the farmer tribe and the pastoralists um, that were both trying to engage in adaptation efforts. This weakened the flexibility, the changeability of the customary tenure system and its ability to, to, to adapt quickly and, and resolve problems and change relationships uh, as needed. The migrants, the, 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 the nomadic pastoralists began to adapt by just claiming land rights under statutory law and ignoring customary law because it, it no longer uh, worked. This then decreased tenure security for farmers who responded by evicting the nomads from lands that they had, uh, they had uh, occupied and prohibited land access to the nomadic populations. So the farmers reacted to the government intervention and the large increase in crop damage caused by livestock by burning the bush areas, the grazing areas next to the crops in order to discourage entry into the overall area by pastoralists and their herds. The nomads then reacted to this by taking the herds directly into the unharvested areas uh, in order to graze and by burning farming villages. The farmers then reacted by killing livestock. The nomads, re the nomads reacted by arming themselves. The farmers then armed themselves as well. The Darfur War then had a very large element of this problem that uh, really supported and facilitated the ongoing uh, violence. The rebels were aligned with the farmers, initially acted against government interventions. The Janjaweed, aligned with the nomads, the pastoralists, were then easily recruited into the government's war efforts with promises of, of land and money. So in exchange for the Janjaweed participating in the war, the government told them they would be able to keep the land that they, that they took over. Instead of, of in pursuing this, this exchange and engaging the rebel military forces, the Janjaweed instead went directly to the land, uh, evicted and burned villages and, and just took over the, uh, the land, causing forced dislocation of, of farming communities and then subsequent migration. But adaptation continues even in, in this fairly difficult environment um, and so what we saw then after the Darfur violence had gone on for some time, 
was actually forms of adaptation that were fairly interesting. Discreet co the conversations occurred, secret conversations occurred between secondary occupants on land. In other words, these are pastoralists aligned with the Janjaweed between them and the IDPs, the internally dislocated persons, the farmers aligned with the rebels regarding market sales, land occupation on the land that the Janjaweed and their associates occupy. So basically you had the constituencies of both sides in the war start to talk to each other, apart from the military confrontation of kind of the military parts of of these constituencies. So constituency A, the farmers began to, in a discreet way, talk with uh, uh, constituency B, uh, the nomads, about new ways of, of, of adaptation, right? So future livelihood change for internally dislocated persons, the farmers, resulting from their stay in camps and, and, and towns. So, so uh, presently, of course, the war has calmed down some, there's been some return uh, uh, from the farmers uh, in their in their camps to their lands. And what we're seeing now is because the IDPs, the internally dislocated persons, spent so much time in the towns of, of uh, Darfur, and now they've gone back to some of their lands, what they have established are very strong rural urban linkages between where they are now on their farming lands and where they were uh, stationed as, as dislocated persons in, in the, the towns and cities. This has now resulted in a vibrant economic relationship between the rural and urban sectors and it is itself a form of, of adaptation. So now there's greater movement and connection between rural and urban areas. And so what we see is, is government policy that, that's very much missed an opportunity. Uh, so the lessons that we can take for, from this case, uh, some of these forms of adaptation themselves can be fairly fragile, meaning they're very sensitive to policy change. So, so we saw a largely successful adaptation effort on the part of the farmers and the, the, the nomadic uh, population in Darfur. Uh, we saw that then completely up, come apart uh, because of new policy from uh, from the government. So, so the lesson here is that some of these adaptation forms can be very sensitive to policy change. And so we have to be very careful what policies we're actually implementing. So th this actually opens the door, the sensitivity to getting the policy wrong open, opens the door to, to making really serious mistakes in terms of policy. In other words, we think we're implementing the right policy, but instead it makes things worse. Right. So this idea of, about about policy from the center, valuing things like clarity of policy, predictability, rigidity and exclusivity and land rights. These are not applicable in all situations that need adaptation, particularly where experimentation in adaptation is needed. And we see a very kind of uh, uh, sort of visceral example of this where what was thought to be good policy and was gonna support adaptation had the opposite effect, okay? So, so in many cases, what, what is needed in terms of on the ground adaptation, climate change scenarios, is not uh, the international voice or even the voice from the center telling, dictating to local communities what they should be doing based on a set of assumptions, but instead a significant degree of flexibility, ambiguity, elasticity, changeability, and experimentation in terms of how resource rights regimes change in order to facilitate successful uh, adaptation, right? So what this means is a much more decentralized, much more localized uh, effort at adaptation that is able to make on the spot change and solution making by authorities that they themselves live from day to day, the adaptation needs that, that need to be addressed. Okay, thank you.